the act of working with food rewards concerns some horse owners, quite a few of them, uh, as far as like putting weight on their horses, um, like meaning that their horses don't need extra weight. So I get this question quite often, you know, how do you deal with horses that are either already overweight and so they don't need more food or are prone to becoming overweight? And then what about horses that have metabolic conditions? Hey there, welcome to another episode of the Willing Equine Podcast. I'll be recording this episode in my car, so the audio may not be super clear, and sometimes I have my kids with me, so if you hear a little bit from them, I apologize, but hopefully you can still enjoy the podcast. I'd love to hear from you after you listen to the podcast, so feel free to comment on any of my social media platforms or email me or even send me an anchor voice message. I think a uh, really common concern that uh, some horse owners have with um, working with positive reinforcement, because a lot of times that directly equals to working with food rewards. So the act of working with food rewards concerns some horse owners, quite a few of them, uh, as far as like putting weight on their horses, um, like meaning that their horses don't need extra weight. So. I get this question quite often, you know, how do you deal with horses that are either already overweight and so they don't need more food or are prone to becoming overweight? And then what about horses that have metabolic conditions like EMS or IR or Cushing's or uh, PSSM or there's all kinds of stuff out there. So how do we help our horses to be their happiest and healthiest, happiest with the positive reinforcement training, and then healthiest meaning that they're not excessively overweight, and how do we keep using food rewards and such in a way that's safe? Well, I guess you could kind of say that I'm uniquely qualified (laughs) to talk about this because I have um, quite a few easy keepers. Actually, I have a little mini pony that, you know, all mini ponies are... I don't know about all of them, but I have seen that quite a few mini ponies are um, very prone to carrying a lot of weight easily. And then I also have two um, quarter horse paints, and the older one is definitely very prone to carrying too much weight and the younger one she's still growing and such so she's not has never been overweight but I can already tell that she is going to be an easier keeper so oh and then I also have in my main claim to fame (laughs) is uh I have an Appaloosa mare that has uh, she's pre-cushionoid so she's had multiple tests for Cushing's and it's kind of I don't know there's not a definitive I don't know, the, the vets are recommending that we wait until she's a little bit older and they think that the test then will come back consistently positive. I'm not 100% sure how that works, or I kind of am, but I'm, I'm not a vet, so I'm not going to go on about that in this podcast episode, but I wanted to say that she does have symptoms of Cushing's and has had positive tests for Cushing's, and she's also... Um, Uh, IR and she is very very easy keeper because basically all that means is that she looks at food and she gains weight Um, quite a few of my horses are that way so how do I work with them in such a way where I can use food rewards while also not creating obesity and physical problems and founder and all of this so I want to talk about that Um, in the really I, I kind of want to say that there's, well, okay. So the first place to start whenever we have a horse that is struggling to keep off the weight, I think the first place to, place to look is in, um, is in their lifestyle. So I think we, the traditional horse world, modern horse world, we use exercise to, or forced exercise, I should say. So we use you know, workouts and round penning and treadmills and walkers and all of that to counter the effects of our, their modern living. So high sugar feeds, lots of grain, limited 
movements of their installs or small flat pastures uh, that are you know, square and no activity involved. They're not with companions that are keeping them moving around. So there's a lot in their day-to-day -day lives that are making it harder for them to keep off the weight because they're living this sedentary life. And then we show up once a day and run them around in circles. Um, and then that kind of combats that sedentary life. So it's like somebody who sits at a um, a computer desk all day and then has their one hour of exercise per day that they get and that keeps them from becoming overweight or unhealthy. And while it's a, it works, obviously it works, it's going to make, if that's the type of lifestyle your horse is living, and then you're trying to do the positive reinforcement on top of it with food rewards, and naturally then we're not forcing exercise. We want them to want to, you know, engage with us and increase their movement and um, participate. But there's food involved in this activity it's going to be very hard, very hard to keep the weight off. Um, and so the first place we need to be looking is changing that lifestyle. If we can get them moving for the other 23 hours a day, we may not even need to worry about the fact that we're using food during training or what type of food and how much food and all of that. If they're moving enough through the rest of their day, then it won't matter that 10 or 15 minute training session you did that had hay pellets involved. Um, which I'm going to get into in a second. So that is a huge factor. You know, get them out of stalls, get them into big pastures, enriching pastures, pastures with hills and and pathways and forage and um, trees and rocks and twists and turns and all kinds of stuff and also have companions. Companions move each other around. They go from resource to resource, so they don't necessarily just push each other. They also follow each other. So if one horse leaves the little community, the herd, and walks over to the water, the rest of the horses will typically walk over there as well. And then the next horse will go back over to the hay, and then the rest of the horses will go. And then one horse will go off to graze, and then those horses will follow. And then one horse will go to see what's going on at the barn, and then the rest of the horses will follow. So you can see how there's lots of movement that's getting involved in their day-to-day -day life just by having a herd with them. The next part is obvious. So getting them out of stalls was the one. And then the next one, um, so the enrichment and then the social companions. And you can also specifically reduce how much eating they're doing at a standstill so larger pastures will encourage them seeking and walking around looking for that special blade of grass and that little piece of leaf over here or whatever but if it's flat green manicured grass they don't have to really walk around much to get their food they just have to stop dead and eat what's under their feet now they still will move while grazing but this is not going to maximize movement for the food that they're getting so Actually, I'm a huge proponent of um, larger pastures that are not really green and manicured. Like, I don't actually want to see a ton of grass. What I want to see is different types of grass in different areas with different plants, and some areas are sparser than others, and they have to actually go looking for their food. Now, obviously, we can't all you know, replicate this. This is expensive to have this much land and it has to be a certain type of land and so on. So what we can do is our best to replicate it in um, a man-made way. So we can, you know, maybe we have a dry lot. You could take little handfuls of hay and hide it all around in the pasture in different areas, you know, along the fence line, up in the trees, under rocks, um, not completely under, but you get my point, beside logs, um, little bits here, little bits there. So you're going to encourage, like, they take a little nibbling bites here, and then they move, and little nibbling bites here, and then they move. And it's, they're moving quite a few steps, not just one step, another big mouthful of grass or hay. And they're also not sitting at a round bale and just consuming their hay all day long in one spot. Um, actually, my horses, I do have a round bale for my horses. It's in a slow feeder net, so it slows down how fast they're eating it. Um, but I noticed that even with the one inch slow feeder net that they have access to 24 seven, they are much more prone to gaining weight then than when during the spring and the fall, we have grass that comes up and even though it's kind of sparse and it gets grazed down quickly, um, 
and I know some studies would show then that there's higher sugar content and all that, my horses actually do better during those times because they're moving, looking for those pieces of grass. And so I think the movement compensates for the potentially that little bit higher sugar in the grass. Although I've seen the opposite argued that that's not true. So I don't know what to believe anymore. I'm questioning my whole life. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm sure you can... You can sympathize with that in the horse world. One person says this, the other person says that. Oh, now there's this new study. Anyway, going off on a bunny trail. But just so you know, I have those experiences too, and I question my life's existence over new research studies. So um, my horses actually do the best when there's sparse grass up and they leave the hay bales and they go looking for it. So even though it's green grass and I have laminitic prone horses, um, they actually do best and they lose weight at this point because they're moving and looking and seeking and foraging. So we can replicate this in um, with spreading our hay in little tiny bits around or alfalfa. Maybe they have their hay bale, but they get a little bit of alfalfa every day. You can um, spread it that way you know, spread the alfalfa so that they're having to go and look for it. You can also um, do things like food dispensing hay balls and stuff like that where they have to pull the hay out of the ball um, or push them around to get the pellets out of the ball. And so there's active movement in that, that they're having to push it and get the food out. You can also... Um, I've taken like big bags, like five pound bags of carrots, just raw carrots, and chopped them up into little pieces and then um, spread them and hidden them all over the pasture. And the horses know what's going on because as soon as they finish their afternoon little um, soaked hay pellet snack, they go and start looking for the carrots. And so they're moving all over the place. They're looking up in trees. They're looking, you know, by the rocks. They're using their seeking system to find these carrots. And it gets them off the hay bale and they're moving. So all that's to say is that the more movement that they can get in their everyday life, the less you'll have to worry about them during a 10 to 15 minute training session with food rewards that it's going to be a problem. The next point is the type of food that you're using. Horses need about 2% of their body weight per day in forage. So grass, hay, alfalfa, um, you know, oh, there's different options, but Timothy grass, Bermuda grass, you know, you can keep going. So they need about, two, so for the average horse, so if, let's say we have a thousand pound horse and that's 20 pounds of forage every day that they need as a that's just like they're basic. If we are training with hay pellets, which are just straight forage, I use Timothy alfalfa hay pellets, and I sometimes use just straight Timothy pellets. If I'm training with those and I've measured it out, I've weighed my pellets, I've weighed just to get an idea of what I'm using, not so much that I'm like stingy, like, okay, you can only have, you know, but I have figured out that my treat pouch that I use carries about one pound of hay pellets. Actually, I can't remember. It was one pound or one and a half pounds. I have to go back and look, but whatever. The point is, is that that is such a small portion of their daily forage intake requirements. So if you're having to really restrict how much horse, how much forage your horse is getting, which I would argue against. I am a big believer that the horses will self-regulate if given free access, but I'm talking about in slow feeder way or spread out or whatever. So not just in an open hay bale. Um, I'm a big believer in that. And also that especially with metabolic horses, it's critical that they don't go through starvation periods. So they need small intakes of food all day long versus they had a flake or two in the morning and then nothing all day long and then a flake or two in the evening. Their body is literally in like winter is coming hibernation mode where they're, um, anyway, I could go on about that, but and there's a lot of research out there about that. And, uh, I can, if you contact me, I can send you more information regarding that and how I feed horses in regards to metabolic conditions. But, and also obviously please talk to your vet. I say this on quite a few podcast episodes and it's kind of my disclaimer. I have to, because I am not a licensed veterinarian. I just have a quite a bit of personal experience and that's what I'm sharing with you right now is my personal experience and what I do for my horses and horses that come into training 
If, however, I were to be presented with information that would say the opposite, or I were to learn something new tomorrow, I would change. So I'm not opposed to changing. This is just what I do right now while I'm recording this episode. So, um, so don't eat me alive if you disagree. I all that say is I am not worried about some Timothy pellets. You know, one pound of Timothy pellets once a day when they still need 19 more pounds of forage every day. So if you want to, you could take away a pound of their forage from the rest of the day. Um, But for me, I'm not really that worried about it. It's not a big deal. Now, if you're doing lots and lots and lots of sessions every day, like let's say we did four to six, you know, that's getting up there. That's way more forage. They way more calories that they are consuming. But you know, I don't, I don't know because if they're spending that time during training, then they're not at the hay bale. So what's the difference? What's the difference between them pulling from a slow feeder net and them eating a hay pellet from your hand? So not too worried about that. The next factor is, you know, how can we start integrating more movement into the actual training itself and exercise? So you know, maybe we do, you know, horse isn't moving as much as we want them to. Maybe they even have a health condition where they don't move as much or they're just not used to moving. Um, so we, they still need that, you know, uh, quote unquote forced exercise, which we're not going to force it, but you know what I mean? Like a, a planned exercise routine. And I get that. And I, I do implement this for my horses as well, especially during hay bale times when there's, they're not moving around as much. Um, or if we've been doing more training sessions than usual, and I feel like uh, that they've do- been doing a lot of stationary training, so a lot of just standing there while receiving food reinforcers, and that we need to start adding some movement in to get them more exercise, and plus also to be able to ride and for them to be able to perform certain behaviors, they need to have the muscle tone to be able to do so, to carry a rider, to carry a saddle, all that. So we need to be able to get them fit as well. This is a gray area because it requires a foundation of training. I can't just start on the first day of training my horse with positive reinforcement and with autonomy and all of that with choice by expecting them to lunge at a walk, trot, and canter in a perfect reverse round pen circle right off the bat. I'm just not going to be able to do that. That's impossible. And if it does happen, I would argue that maybe um, the the horse is cleverly piecing together old training with this new training, which is completely fine. I'm not saying that that's bad, but when you're looking at the idea of training something from start to finish with as close to positive reinforcement as possible, um, so you're starting completely over from fresh then you're not going to be able to build such a complex behavior on the first day. So that's just kind of my point that I'm getting to. If you want to combine training, that's your own decision. So you're going to have to build these behaviors up and it's going to take time. And that's kind of where the tricky part comes in because how much of this is a medical necessity and how much of this is that we just want our horses to be more fit, how much of it is is that we're not willing to make changes in the rest of their life. Like we need to figure this all out and it kind of comes down to the individual situation. If I have a horse that is really just like medically in an emergency situation as far as like they're just gaining weight way too fast, um, but they really don't want to move and they're at risk of foundering and all that, I might consider, you know, combining training or just maintaining, um, you know, maybe we have one behavior that we maintain as a negative reinforcement exercise. I'm not opposed to this where, you know, if they round pen very quietly and they know the drill and they know how to walk track canter on cue and it's, they're not stressed about it, um, that it's maybe not their favorite thing in the whole world because there's no food involved, but it's just a low key exercise. They're just like, okay, we're just going to walk around for a while or lunging, you know, trotting around for a while, cantering for a while. Um, that is a possibility that for these horses, maybe we maintain that one exercise where it is a forced exercise because we need it for medical reasons. But my encouragement to you would be to start fading that out as soon as you can, um, because it might impact the rest of your training. It might 
create this kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation where the horse never knows, is this going to be an aversive situation or um, a positive one? Like, is this going to be, are we going to go lunge today or are we going to do, you know, a positive reinforcement training session today? Uh, most horses, though, are pretty good at picking out context cues. So whether or not you have a, a lunge line could tell the horse that it's a lunging session. And you might start to find them less enthusiastic about those training sessions, which might encourage you to wean them off faster. Um, but anyway, I don't want to go too far into that because that's not, I don't know, there's certain situations, but I don't find them to be as common as you might think think there's a lot we can do um, that could make that not necessary. So there's other things. So if we can build up, like how can we get around having to use this forced exercise with, you know, and, and remember I'm talking about mild to slow escalation of pressure. I'm talking about quick releases, clarity of information. I'm shaping plans. When I talk about training with negative reinforcement, I'm not talking about lunging for respect. I'm not talking about um, leadership and join up. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, okay, we've taught the horse in a very strategic way that when I um, you know, smooch to them, it means to start walking faster. And if they don't respond to the smooch, then I'll kind of wave the whip a little bit. And then if they don't respond to that, then we start to escalate. And this is, you see where my problem comes in as far as, um, I don't, I don't like to escalate that far, but for some horses, you might reach that point where you have to escalate that far. And then where's that line as far as when is it considered abusive and when is it considered just good training, um, or not even good training, but just training in general, like, um, that it's just necessary for the success of the training. So this is why I've moved away a lot from training with negative reinforcement. Not that it's inherently abusive or wrong or bad. It's just that I don't want to ever have to escalate to that point. And I find that positive reinforcement is way more enjoyable for the horse and the human, way more clearer, and um, the horses are more enthusiastic and willing. And also I find it's more effective. <laughs> it's faster in teaching a lot of behaviors. And uh, especially once you're a very skilled trainer, I can train so many things now that I used to never, like I wouldn't even know how to begin training them with negative reinforcement. But now it's like, oh yeah, no problem. Like, let's just, you know, click this, click that. Cool, we have this behavior now. Like it's so fast and so easy and I have so much fun and the horses do too. So anyway, went off on a big bunny trail. Again, I'm not encouraging you to do those things, but I am saying there may be a certain situation where it's a medical necessity that forced exercise is implemented. Okay, so moving on to the fun stuff. What about, so how can we encourage more movement with positive reinforcement in our training? So we can build these certain behaviors that will serve us well in getting the horse to move more often or faster or more forward. So things like teaching your horse to lead at liberty or with a halter and leader up on. Once your horse has solid leading behaviors, you can start, you know, very gradually building up to uh, as the horse is comfortable. Some horses will be comfortable right away. Some will take longer. But you can start going on hikes. Like you guys can both start getting exercise. You can start going off into the woods and climbing up mountains and hills and breaking a sweat. Like both of you, go break a sweat. It's fun. It's exciting. And you don't have to be on their back. You can go hiking. Uh, you can also teach reverse round penning. So, or yeah, or some people call it um, around, whatever. Anyway, that's where the human is in the center. There's a temporary pen or maybe even permanent. I don't know. But for me, it's temporary. And um, I use like a, a stick in the ground post that I got from Tractor Supply with um, a non-active electrical white taping strung through it. And I make a big circle, like a 15 meter circle, 20 meter, something like that. So the size of a small round pen. And then the horse goes around the outside and you teach them to go around the outside and you can start working on forward movement uh, at a walk. And then you can build up to the trot and then you can build up to the canter and so on. So you can build up these exercises. You can also use targeting. So targeting for longer duration. So can you walk, you know, a few steps Then can you walk six steps? Now can you walk you know, obviously this is, we're lumping at this point. So you need to build these up in smaller increments, but, um, 
you know, eventually could work up to leading for extended periods, you know, whole lap around the arena before you ever click and reward. Now that, I don't know, arguably I, I've actually never done that. I think that's too long. Um, I like to mix it up and I, some horses do get frustrated with having to follow the target for that long. So that's kind of an iffy one there. I tend to not make it go that long. Um, let's see, what else can you do? Lots of things like um, you can, during your leading practice, you can start teaching long and low, forward down. Um, you can also start implementing crunches and teaching straight backups uh, with a slightly lowered head to lift the back and sit the haunches down so that'll help strengthen for a rider. You can also start teaching turn on the haunches and forehand to build strength and balance. Um, I've been working on some more advanced dressage um, in hand work, so shoulder in, haunches in, leg yields, things like that. That'll prepare a horse for a rider, get them balanced and stronger. You can also, um, let's see, what else can you do as far as exercise goes? You can, oh, teach them to chase a soccer ball. So that's a fun way to get them moving. They start chasing something around. Sometimes, especially younger horses or horses that are very playful, might get really into it in bucking and rearing and chasing and all around. I mean, that's great exercise. That's fantastic. Um, sometimes, depends on the horse, but I will teach my horses to kind of chase me, but I usually do this in protected contact. So I will be on the other side of a fence and I will teach them to chase me down the fence line and back and forth. I don't usually do this when I'm inside the fence because I want it to be a very clear signal to the horse that is, is they're free to behave however they wish to behave, that they can buck and rear and do whatever they want and I, I will be safe. And it's a communication to them that it's time for them to go have fun and that we're just going to be running together. But if I'm in the arena with them or in the pasture with them, I start putting myself at risk if they were to get too playful or whatever. And also, um, I don't want them just to chase me down when I'm in the pasture. When, not, when I'm around them, it's calm, it's in control, we're all relaxed. And so I don't recommend being in the space with them while performing crazy running, chasing behaviors. This isn't to say you can't teach your horse to... Um, do higher energy behaviors while you're there. Obviously, that's perfectly fine. Walk, truck, canter, in hand work, riding, all that. But if you specifically want your horse to kind of let loose and play and have fun and chase you, that chasing behavior, I think, needs to be done in protected contact. And you could set up long protected lines. So you could even be inside the pasture and set up that same you know, the reverse round pen idea, but you could do it in a straight line. That might work, um, but usually just a fence line works really well. And uh, you can, I've seen people teach their horses to walk and trot with a bike. Um, depends on the horse, how safe this is. The horse needs to obviously not be afraid of bikes. You might start off in protected contact doing this. That might reduce how much exercise you're having to get, which I'm a firm believer that humans need to be as fit or as close to as fit as we also expect our horses to be. So, uh, but that being said, you know, if you have like seven horses, like I do, I can't do this with every single horse. I burn out. Like I don't have enough there's not enough calories in the world to keep me running and at full speed back and forth, back and forth with seven horses. I just can't do it. So I have to get creative. Um, ponying. So if you have another horse, maybe you could borrow a friend's horse that is negative reinforcement trained or has more advanced positive reinforcement skill set. Um, and you could teach your horse to pony with that one. So you could, I'd start off at Liberty and have, um, you know, click and reward any time the horse, your horse is up close to that one and start reinforcing them for sticking with the horse. And then you can attach the halter and lead rope on, and then you can start practicing in the arena. Then you can go outside the arena, go on trail rides, stuff like that. Um, what's another idea? You can also go jogging with your horses. A lot of you guys I know are runners. Take your horse on a run. Like, go do it. Like, forget running by yourself. That's useless, pointless <laughs> exercise. <laughs> I literally don't have enough energy to do any exercise on my own. Every ounce of energy I have has to go into exercising my horses and my dogs. Um, so there's never, I'm never running or doing anything without an animal with me. <laughs> so um, if you ever see a crazy lady going down the road with two horses on either side of her, that's me. Um, yeah, so go jogging with your horses and... Uh, 
you know, you can work up to being able to ride under saddle, go for longer periods of walking, trotting, cantering. But again, like I mentioned before, the problem with this is that these have to be built up. So if you're starting off with an obese horse or a horse with a medical issue, you may have to maintain a certain exercise, forced exercise to keep your horses, you know, welfare in mind. Like at what point is it more ethical to, or what, where's the ethical line as far as when I have a horse that is, if they don't get the exercise, they will be in severe pain and obese and founder and all of this, you know, and, but I also want to train with positive reinforcement, like absolutely let's train with positive reinforcement, but you might have to maintain some old stuff for a while until you build up strong enough behaviors in positive reinforcement because you're you're training a whole bunch of new stuff from the beginning from scratch and again look at the lifestyle look at the diet take sugar out of your horse's diets um take you know you don't they don't need a lot of green eat it's the um the most i feed like if, ooh, i'm getting off on a tangent but forage first so test your hay make sure it's low you know nsc and um that it's got is good quality all of that and then for a metabolic horse or a horse with that's a really easy keeper like looks at food and gains weight the most they're going to need are some loose trace minerals so free choice trace minerals and maybe a multivitamin and you might have to throw in like some alfalfa for the uh, protein and all that or um, something like that that's all my horses get as far as my super easy keepers like literally that's all they get some salt and then they each have like a, a mare supplement and anyway but as far as like their nutrients goes that's it the most i feed horses um an, um, an easier keeper the most i'd consider feeding them is a ration balancer and even that is too many calories for a lot of horses so if you're struggling with your horse's weight look at their diet look at their lifestyle look at what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis when you're not there and then you might choose to maintain a certain forced exercise but try and make it as calm as possible as relaxed as possible we don't want to trigger the stress hormones and cortisol and all of that because that negatively impacts um, a horse's ability to um, have a healthy weight loss and it, if anyway the, you can look into the science of all that but if your horse is in a high stress state when exercising you're kind of doing harm and you're actually not kind of you are um, but you're not going to actually be impacting their ability to lose weight as much as you think you are and so it's much better for them to lose weight in a, um, a healthy way um, and to be careful and cautious about it. And when I say cautious, I mean, as far as like use shaping plans, try not to stress them out, um, you know, make it a relaxed situation, but you know, they are going to have that positive stress in their muscles and all that as they're burning calories and building up muscle and all that. So it's not that it's no stress. It's just a different kind. We don't want the negative high stress situation we want a positive situation so even in that old forced exercise activity try and reduce the f any um any negative stress in the situation be strategic be patient have very clear cues let them warm up we don't want any horses just walking into the round pen and running madly around um so yeah so there's that and also when you have, you know, you need to be very clear to them when is this is a positive reinforcement training session and when this is not. So typically in those quote unquote forced exercise situations, I won't have my treat pouch on. Um, I have a halter and lead rope. I take them or I actually don't have a halt. I'll lead them into wherever I'm going to be uh, with a halter and lead rope, but I take it off. Um, but to them, the cue is that I have a long uh, lunging whip which with the lash tied up and it's just that's kind of like their cue there's no treat pouch and she has a lunging whip so this is my cue and I also do it in a certain area so a certain designated area and um, so they know they know that when we go into the certain designated area this is what's going to happen and there has been some hesitations that have shown up but it's really not so bad because 
I, whenever I ask him to come to a stop, I walk up to him, I give him nice deep scratches and I make it as positive and low stress for them as possible. Um, it's just, they just know what's happening. They just know that this is exercise time and they're like, okay, fine. Well, it's gotta, gotta do this. It's like getting up in the morning and having to go on a run and you're just like, oh, I don't want to do this. Um, so that's kind of what I feel like is happening for them. But I try and avoid having to do this when and if possible. I only do it if it's a medical necessity or uh, the, the horse just isn't far enough along in their positive reinforcement training that they don't that they can't exercise in other ways. So hopefully this gives you a really clear idea of how to help horses and how to keep the weight off and how to deal with transitioning to positive reinforcement when you do have a horse that's overweight already or easy or readily gains weight. Um, yeah, so I think that's the consensus of everything I had to say. I realized that in this episode, I may have mentioned some things that might be surprising to a few people, like the fact that I will maintain some certain activities that are negative reinforcement if there's a medical need. If you have any questions about this or that you need clarification on any one point, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about it. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, and again, like I said, it's only for very, very unique cases. This is not something that I heavily promote and I'm only bringing it up because it's reality. It's reality for a lot of people and a lot of horses. And I don't want you to start with positive reinforcement and then your horse to gain too much weight and then for you to uh, suddenly feel like you can't do this and your vet tells you to stop feeding them food and then you give up on training positive reinforcement and food rewards. Don't do that. Like, don't give up. Don't just reach out for help. Consider that there are other options available to you um, as far as making that transition a healthy transition. It doesn't have to be cold turkey. It doesn't have to be, all right, I'm done with all of that old stuff. Now I'm only training with positive reinforcement. You know, so what if my horse gains a bunch of weight? We don't want that to happen either because that's not healthy. And I'd argue that that is, and that's a moral, um, pro there's a problem there that I don't know that that's the best decision. As much as I heavily promote using positive reinforcement, your horse's health and well being is at the top of the food chain as far as what's priority. You can't sacrifice their body for their mind, but you also can't sacrifice their mind for their body. So it's like they, they are very closely linked and we have to play that line. We have to figure out what the individual horse needs and how to work with it um, to make it the best decision for everybody. And I think gradually over time, absolutely, you can transition over to all positive reinforcement. I just think for some horses, there will be that need physically for them to maintain some forced exercise. Um, but again, let's try and force it as little as possible. Let's try and make it as pleasant as possible uh, and to be as clear as possible, not create this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation. Um, and if you start coming in... If, recognizing any problems, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help and we can problem solve what's going on. Um, and I really do encourage you to be proactive in trying your best to implement as much exercise as possible through positive reinforcement. Even if you're still like once a week maintaining that forced exercise, eventually it's maybe once every other week. And then maybe it's never, you know, like really quickly you can fade it out. And that's my goal for you. My goal is for you to not need that anymore as your skill set with positive reinforcement increases. And before you know it, your horse will be fit and happy and training with positive reinforcement, healthy and everything all together. There just may be a transition period. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to find out more, head to my website, thewillingequine.com. On there, I have a really extensive blog. I'm a very prolific writer. And I also have a an FAQ page. And the FAQ has all kinds of things. It has questions and answers about training and about my training specifically, as well as just general about working with positive reinforcement. There's also sections on there about health and um, behavior, so all of that. I'm also on a lot of different social media platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. So check those out and I'd love to hear from you. So don't hesitate to email or send me a message.